Hi, welcome to This Week in Ames. I'm Susan Guiazda. On today's show, we check in with SciRide. My guest today is Sherry Kyrus, the Transit Director for SciRide. Sherry, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's been a while since you visited with us, and yet I know a lot of things have happened at SciRide over the last few months. Yeah, we've had a lot of exciting new projects uh, get started and uh, be available to the public. So yes, it's been a very exciting time. One of the things that just happened, which I was hoping you'd touch on a little bit, on uh, recently, just a few days ago, we had the articulated buses arrive in Ames. Finally, yes, <laughs> long-awaited articulated buses. And again, for those who don't know what the articulated buses are, those are the longer bus and a half equivalent um, that kind of have an accordion in the middle of it. So um, we uh, actually had a consultant study uh, several years ago uh, where they recommended these vehicles as a, an efficient way to operate um, on our orange route, which is actually the busiest route in the state of Iowa um, and we carry a lot of people and with the longer vehicles um, we can actually with the two articulated buses we have we can replace three of our our regular buses so we only have the driver's wages and consumables for two buses instead of three so it's a great way to provide that additional capacity that we need on that route at a very efficient way and cost. So Sherry explain to me how the articulated buses were funded. They're funded through a special grant that we got, uh, a national grant, uh, for the purchase of articulated buses. So I think there's a lot of confusion in the community about um, where that money came from and how it can be used. But it is a capital grant for articulated buses. So we couldn't use that money, for example, to uh, pay our, our operating costs, so the driver wages and so forth. Uh, it is for capital for a specific purpose, um, and we were lucky enough to be able to be chosen for that. Now, I just have to ask you, they look like they might be hard to drive. Are the drivers clamoring to drive them or a little hesitant? Um, actually, they're clamoring. Um, I was, I was uh, talking with a, a group of drivers the other day, and they're very excited, and they're already trying to think about areas and ways to use these vehicles even more in our service other than the Orange Route. So I think they're very excited about them. Um, we did actually have a demonstration bus in the community. It was probably about six months ago now. Uh, and all of our trainers and our supervisors uh, and a few of our drivers that had an opportunity to actually drive it. Um, and they really, really enjoyed it. Uh, they said it turns actually a little bit easier, sharper than our regular 40-foot vehicles. It does move a little bit differently around the corners, so we'll need to get used to that. But other than that, they think they're going to be very, very fun to drive. The other kind of unique feature of it is we have three doors instead of two on these buses since they're longer. And the driver actually has a um, TV monitor in the dashboard for the third door. So we can make sure we can see our customers as they're going in and out and making sure that they're safely using the vehicle. So that'll be kind of a new fun feature as well for the drivers. So. Are there route considerations when you um, have these really long buses where they can't make certain turns? No, actually, I could say they, they turn better than our regular 40-foot vehicles, and uh, we did try it uh, on every route in our system when we had the demonstration bus here, and we didn't find any situation where they couldn't maneuver safely uh, in the community. So we can use them wherever in the community. However, obviously, we'll want to use them smartly uh, and just on those routes and those times of the day when, when we need that additional capacity on a bus route. Well, like we said, you have a lot of projects. One of the ones that we uh, touched base with you a while back was the intermodal facility. Now that project is complete. How is that building working for you? It's working great. Um, it's about 60 to 70 percent uh, full right now. Uh, we do still have spaces available in the uh, covered portion of the parking. And that's at 129 Hayward, and that's Correct. the... Um, has offices and then parking levels. Right, it has parking and then the uh, inner city carriers, so the Jefferson and the Burlington Trailways, as well as the Executive Express have offices uh, and lobbies, waiting areas within the uh, the facility. So it's they love it. Um, we've, we've had conversations with them. It's working out very well for those carriers. It's, it's, it really does become a focal point in the community for the transportation services. So instead of being spread throughout the community, uh, they're in one location and, and easy to get to. So that's been a really big benefit. I think for the community for this facility besides the parking factor which provides parking for Iowa State students and then also capacity for hopefully the revitalization that's now happening in Campus Town. It's interesting to, to drive past that facility when you drive past on Hayward you get such a completely different look than when you go around the back side of the facility both marked very nicely with very um, 
a nice looking signage, so it's not a surprise finding them, but it's just an interesting because you're dealing with multi-levels. You are. Um, actually, the, the facility is a little bit different than what we had originally envisioned it to be. We had a larger project that would have actually filled up the site with uh, structured parking, uh, how, and that was a, a, a project that was about $39 million, um, and we received about $8.5 million, so quite a bit less funding. So we had to revise the project down to the scale of the, the funding that we had. Uh, and I think the, the architects did an outstanding job of, of uh, maximizing the parking and the office space uh, within the budget that we had. So yeah, you will see on the one side it is a structured, and then when you go on the Sheldon side, it looks more like a surface lot type of a facility. Well, and clearly there's room to expand. Absolutely. So additional phases perhaps will give Hopefully that a new Hopefully someday, look. someday we'll get some additional grant funding and be able to uh, build that second structure on, on the uh, surface lot. And building seems to be something that you're very involved in all over. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a, a little unusual for a transit director, but yes, we are uh, also expanding at our facility. Um, we have grown substantially uh, in the last six years, and I think you probably are aware we've had year after year of record ridership, um, and we've added in the last six years about a million and a half additional rides uh, on our service. So obviously that means we need more buses and we need facilities to house those. Um, if we have, as we have added vehicles, um, we have not uh, added the, the bus storage area. So uh, we will be adding a, a section, new section onto the front of the building on the north side of the building. Uh, near University Boulevard um, that will have it's about an 8200 square foot addition bus storage addition that will house about 11 vehicles on top of that um, we did flood in 2010 um, we got about a foot of, of water in our facility so we will be doing a flood wall and gates uh, that will protect our facility in the future if there is flooding uh, that does occur in Ames again. And then kind of the third piece of the construction that, that the public would not see but functionally makes us work a lot better. Um, in the original piece of our, our building, uh, the ceiling, the ductwork is lower. Uh, and our articulated buses and our hybrid buses cannot fit under that. So they can only fit in certain places in the facility. So we will be raising that ductwork so that our vehicles can go throughout the facility. So that'll be a, a nice addition for us as well. What's the time frame for that project? Uh, we hope to get started here in, uh, toward the end of March or the beginning of April. Uh, and it'll be about a 14 month project to get all of that completed. Uh, the majority of the work, uh, particularly what the public will see, will happen over the summer because we do have to operate from this facility at the same time as we're doing some major construction. So it will be a challenge and we're trying to time that when we have fewer buses and drivers and so forth using the facility, which is over the summer months when students aren't in session. Well, let's talk about ridership for a minute. You mentioned uh, record ridership, five, uh, close to six million rides. Right. People might say, wow, a community of 60,000, how do we have so many rides? Again, a ride is not a, a, an individual person riding. It's the number of trips, correct? Yeah, it's yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's one person with one ride is what that's considered, not not a round trip, if that's what you're mm -hmm. referring to. Okay. <laughs> so if, if you're not being able to track how many times a student rides no. that day, you're just looking at how many people you're transporting from place to place. Right, from A to B, absolutely. And so, so. we have a lot of riders who are probably riding the bus multiple times a day. Absolutely, uh, particularly when it comes to the the university where students and faculty are in and out. Uh, for classes all day long, uh, students tend to, to ride more. Uh, we also find, uh, particularly on campus, where uh, they may have a, uh, a class on one side of the campus and will ride two or three or maybe four stops, get off and, uh, and go to another class on the other side of campus as well. So a lot of inter-campus trips as well as campus to um, maybe their housing in West Ames, for example. Now, um, why don't you explain again how SciRide's funded, because that itself is, is sort of a unique arrangement. We are uniquely funded, and it works very, very well for the community, and I think that's why you see the strong ridership that you do because of, of the funding structure that we have. Obviously, we get federal and state dollars uh, and, and dollars through the fare box, but the, a majority of the local dollars and a majority of our funding uh, comes from a three-party agreement between Iowa State, City of Ames, and then the government of the student body through the student fees. Uh, the student fees is the largest portion of that. It's a, about three and a half million dollars uh, that is provided by the students uh, to support the service. About a million and a half from the city and about 800,000 from uh, the university to support uh, the service. So again, a majority of the funding comes from those local funding sources. 
And as um, Iowa State University enrollment increases, that is having an effect on the ridership, which we're seeing. <laughs> it is, absolutely, yeah. When, when enrollment goes up, our rides go up as well. Actually double uh, the amount that the, the increase in uh, enrollment does is what we're finding. So it does have a magnifying effect for us um, and, and uh, the reason why we've grown and, and the challenges that it creates for the infrastructure with the buses and the facility as well. Um, we did calculate that a couple years ago and it's about, for every student enrolled at Iowa State, it generates about 173 rides. So. Uh, on an again, annualized on basis? An an, yeah, on an annualized basis. So, uh, again, that's a, a large portion of why our ridership is as high as it is. Well, you have to feel good knowing that you have such a well-used transit system. And while there may be a lot of student ridership, uh, when you look at a SciRide map and you see how much of the community is served by SciRide, right. you know it's a, a wonderful community asset. It is, and we hear that every day from the residents and the students uh, going to Iowa State, and particularly as they travel around the nation and, and see how other cities and, and universities do it. We're kind of a model uh, when it comes to that, and, and in fact, I just got uh, a call from Topeka, Kansas, who wants to come up and see how we do service up here. Uh, they've heard great things about us and, uh, and want to see how we do it to see if that could be applicable for the area as well. So, And we usually get about one call like that a year from a community that wants to see how we're doing things. That is great. Before we wrap up, one more thing I wanted to ask you about, and that's the new GPS uh, technology, the Next Bus. Yes, another exciting project that we've had. Um, this one has been in the works for a couple of years, and it actually was one of the most requested amenities uh, that we uh, include in our service, and, and it's a real-time GPS tracking uh, system of our buses. So what it does, in essence, is if you are standing at the bus stop uh, and you access the information for that bus stop, it will tell you what time the next three buses will be arriving uh, at that bus stop. So you don't have to stand out there and wait, particularly in when the weather is bad, snowy, rainy, or whatever. You don't have to stand out there and not know if the bus is on time or not. You are able to know um, right there and then uh, where the bus is and how soon it'll be I there. just think that's a great thing. For me, it, it would be as I was running to my bus stop. <laughs> there you go. We to get see that which one I, Which one I've, <laughs> I've missed and when the next yes, one's coming. Yes, but what, what an exciting uh, use of technology. Absolutely. And if people want to know more about that, uh, we have a lot of information on our website at SciRide.com. Feel free to go there. We have a user's guide. We have the bus stop numbers, so you can correlate what your bus stop is to the number uh, to be able to use that system as well. So a lot of good information there if, if folks are confused on how to use that. And again, you're always welcome to give us a call at 292-1100, and we'll be glad to walk uh, folks through that as well. Well, Sherry, always so much going on Great. at SciRide. I'd love yeah. to have you stop by because we just get uh, wonderful updates, a lot happening, and I, I, I welcome you back. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, March is a busy month for the City of Ames, and don't forget to join us at the annual Eco Fair from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. on Saturday, March 30th. You can join us at the Community Center Gym. There'll be vendors and activities, booths, and things for kids of all ages. Well, that's our show for today. Thanks for watching, and tune in next week for This Week in Ames.